see. And we got to make sure make sure we're recording recording it. Good. Okay, beautiful. Now and now I have to share it on your page. Okay, great. Talk now, Kamal. Let's see if uh, the echo is, if we got rid of the echo. Yeah, I don't hear an echo from on your end, at least. Yeah, I think, so, I, think I sorted out what that was. Okay. So now we click on. It's posted on your page. I already uh, did it. No, no. That's, You're that's, muted. that's no. the earlier one. Okay, I'm waiting for it on my page. Let me go here. You have it up on your page, uh, my page. I do. I do see it up on my page, and I did share it on yours. But I'll double check. Yep, I see it on your page. We're on. Okay. Let me see. I think we should start. Okay, we're well, good. I I still don't see it on Facebook, but I'll just. I see it on your page. It. You don't see it on your page. Let me go back to the other page. Uh, up, up, up. Yep, I see it. I just went off of it. <clears throat> so let's start. All right. We are good. We still have this delay. I, if I, I'm not hearing it, and I'm not hearing the echo. I think we got it. I think we're here finally. Okay, I'm not hearing it, and I'm not hearing the echo. I think we got it. Okay, now okay. I hear the echo. Wait a minute. I think I know. Of course, maybe your Facebook is not muted, so we're hearing it on your Facebook. Yeah. So your Facebook page should be muted. All right, I have it muted. Okay, great. Um, Let's start. Okay, we're good to go. We're good to go. All right. Sorry about the difficulties. Hope everyone can uh, can uh, was able to get in, or you'll be able to get in at this point. We'd like to welcome you. My name is Kamal Kenyatta, and I'm here with Dr. Rita Fierro, and uh, we're going to be talking about can white and black people have an honest conversation about racism and the aim is to be able to possibly open a doorway to a place where honest dialogue can take place. Uh, first, let me introduce Dr. Uh, Fierro. Dr. Rita Fierro, PhD, is the author of Digging The Seeds of and Radio. For 30 years, she has studied systemic racism, combining a coaching approach with evaluative thinking. She leads a consulting firm that assesses projects, social, inequ social inequities, and provides processes 
that illuminate complexity for businesses, foundations, nonprofits, NGOs, and the United Nations. Dr. Rita has a PhD in African American Studies from Temple University in Philadelphia, PA. I didn't know that you were a Temple grad also, and a master's in sociology from the University of Rome, Rome, Italy. She co-founded Home for Good Coalition so as to transform systemic racism by placing the voices of people who were traumatized by systems at the center of its work. Born in New York City, she lived in her family's ancestral town in Italy from the age of 10 until her college years. Dr. Rita comes from a long line of traditional healers and she is both a Reiki and family constellation practitioner. She's also the author of what, what is the name of your book? Digging Up the Seeds of White Supremacy. Oh, right, right, yeah, so yeah, Digging Up the Seeds of White Supremacy, which I'm sure is on Amazon and other uh, book uh, stores and uh, distributors. So welcome, Dr. Fierro. Thank you, Professor Kenyatta. So, so Professor Kamal Kenyatta is an author, speaker, and professor. He has taught African-American studies for more than 25 years at various colleges and universities, when he developed a reputation for honesty and clarity. These are really precious virtues. Um, his goal is to help Black people reframe and center their understanding of our history and culture to create a vision of victory. He has degrees from Jersey State, City State College, Princeton Theological Seminary, and Temple University. Professor Kenyatta is the author of the new book, The White People Show, How to Understand Racism and Still Be Wrong About It. Good. So, now, we can- Go for it, go for it that uh, I'm gonna call you Rita, you can call me Kamal. We only met, what, uh, less than two weeks ago in a program that we were both involved in and uh, we recognized that there was an intersection of what we were, attempt what we were attempting to do. And so that's how this um, live feed came about. We decided, well, let's try this and do this because we had a conversation and it was it was it was revealing, and so we said, well, we need to do this um, uh, this way. So let me ask you, uh, Dr. Fierro, how did you get into the work that you're in? What compelled you, moved you toward this? I get that question a lot. And sometimes I get tired. So in the, in the spirit of honesty, I get tired of telling the same story. And so I try to like t try sometimes to force myself to think about it differently or to think about it in a new way. Um, so I'll tell you the version of that story that just kind of came to me recently, which is that I think life for all human beings is ultimately about coming home to ourselves. And I have a very, very strong sense of freedom and always had since I was a little kid. And I think that yearning for freedom took me in my early years to kind of be extremely passionate about what I saw as the lack of freedom that was clearest in my face, and that was racism. Um, and so, it's been kind of fascinating to be on this journey. I mean, I was raised in a, um, I was born in New York and then my parents decided to move me to Italy when I was 10. And I had a lot of experiences of being, of um, people being prejudiced against me for being American. And that just kind of sharpened my sensitivity because at some point I went to college and I realized hmm. um, okay. when I lost my yeah. accent, I realized you know, if I had been black, if my skin color had noticed me as an outsider, I would have been an outsider my whole life. Um, but suddenly mm. when I moved to college, I was able to blend in 
right? And realizing, ah, see, that's how skin color plays. You can't really ever blend it. So mm -hmm. it had me like feel an empathy um, for black folk. Uh, but honestly, I think there was, I feel like we always discover different layers of the reasons why we do things. Mm -hmm. And the layer that I'm discovering now like the, the layer of 19 was racism sucks. You need to do something about it, right? That's what I thought was the reason I was in the work at 19. The reason I think I'm in the work now is because I have a profound yearning for freedom and racism okay. is what I saw got in the way of humans being free. Okay. And you uh, mentioned in our discussion that uh, you had some mentors because I, your work is directed toward white people um, in terms of racism, the racism uh, there. But you told me a story about how you came to that clarity, the clarity on that issue. You want, would you share that? Yeah, sure. So I, I started out as a 20 year old who was on a rampage to save black folk. I mean, as a lot of activists start out and um, I was lucky to have early on um, one black woman at the time, but three black women over the course of the past 27 years um, mm -hmm. who constantly have me sit with the question, why do you care about us so much in this moment? What is it about your own personal pain that is hooking into our personal pain? What is it that you're not seeing about yourself in your journey and what's unresolved in your past that has you so adamant about looking at ours? And so, um, and, you know, they looked at me the way I feel like only older, wise black women can, which is sort of like, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. what's up with you? What's up with you, little white girl? Right? Yeah. Um, they weren't flattered. Um, unlike younger African Americans, sometimes we're happy to see a white woman in the work because they'd like, oh, thank God there are some white people who get it, right? But yeah. the older black women would just look at me with total suspicion, like, what's going on with you? What's what what's over there? I'm fine. I don't need I don't need any saviors. I need yeah. I need you to look at you. And yeah. so my work became this coming together of my personal healing practice of getting more and more honest every day about what there, what I saw in the mirror and then it, how it connected with the unjust world that was still and continues to break my heart. Okay. Yeah, that, um, that piece, you, you, your, your work is somewhat uh, along the lines of uh, people like Tim Wise, um, white gentleman, um, Jane Elliott, who has been, uh, she's been doing work for, I guess, 35, almost 40 years, well, for almost 50 years. Uh, she's been doing work as, as white people addressing the issue of racism uh, to white people. Um, I come at it uh, slightly, uh, slightly different. Um, in terms of why I wrote my book, um, the I recognized that there was not an odd, there was no, there was no real honest discussion when it came to black and white people talking about race. And there would be various incidents that would happen nationally, happen nationally. Like for example, when Obama uh, became president, there was an issue, I forget what it was at the time. And so everyone was saying it's time for the nation to have a discussion about race and racism and so forth. But it's never really a discussion. It's just kind of dancing around the subject. And, um, and when you put black and white people together, that honesty gets em uh, em emphasized or magnified in my um, estimation. Because I conclude as, as in observing this, that generally black people are not honest with white people about how they feel or what they think about racism. And that's because they are afraid of the retaliation that they might encounter in terms of employment, 
housing, a, a, a bevy of things. And so we tend to say uh, what is expected in that conversation. And to be, for Black people to be honest about racism is, um, and that is a no-no in the society, almost on any broadcast that you watch, any podcast that you listen to, most books that you read, there is not that uh, pointing of the finger. So that's com comparable to someone, a woman having been raped, but not fully uh, and honestly identifying her rapist, kind of walking around it. Well, yeah, he kind of looks like it. it was, he was living in a neighborhood, but I don't know, if, you know, there, there is that manby pamby kind of uh, thing. And because we had that non honest conversation, we'd never move the dial. It always stays at the same place or it comes back to the same place. We always end up in the same place. Since, for example, Obama was president, um, when they had the honest conversation, I think he spoke in Philly, um, they have been m multiple instances of the same thing over and over again. And there will be uh, those types of situations where the country will decide, hey, look, it's time to come to grips with racism. The, the, one of the most uh, recent that was compelling that was of the George Floyd uh, case, but there are, there are others, uh, many, many others. And so that's where I, uh, I come, come at that. And it's a hard conversation to have. And I say for, for a black person, uh, we are concerned of how we are going to be, how is it going to affect our life chances, our livelihood and so forth. So in job situations, unemployment, uh, in uh, education, we tap, what is it, tap toe around the, tip toe around the subject just to maintain a semblance of peace until something explodes and then everybody has to uh when when and when anger happens it kinds of it kind of comes out but not in a real significant way uh what, what is your what are you thinking on, on that you well, yeah and maybe it's, maybe question. it's yeah, maybe it's the anger thing, but I was just curious when you said we have the conversation in the same way, which is hiding some stuff, and then we end up in the same place. What is that same place? Is that the anger or are there other other things? That same place is some incident where dignity has, has happened to Black people. Either someone has been killed or they have been assaulted uh, in, in a malicious uh, inhumane way that, and uh, the, the media kind of drives the whole thing. The good thing about social media is that it is, a, it, it is exposing more and more of it. These things have been happening all along, but when Black people, the Black community would say, the, this is what's going on, for example, with the police, the police are doing this, that, and the other. They always sided with the police because there was that well, there was not enough evidence. Uh, it's uh, one person's word against another. But even with the advent of video, there is still that disbelief, that invalidation of the experience that 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 black people have in this country and, and in the world, but in this country in particular. There's that invalidation. Well, there is no racism. There is no, and they will even find black people who will come out and say there is no racism. I remember um, Senator Tim Scott was one of the most uh, recent public ones, I think, 
it was about two, three years ago when he, um, at the State of the Union, I believe it was, uh, he said, there's no racism. You know, and this is a black man, <laughs> this is a black man, there is no racism. And it was the, the biggest insult uh, uh, ever that uh, he would uh, do this. And uh, most black people have no respect for him whatsoever because of that posture. When, when they, in their daily lives, they're encounter, encountering it and he is encountering it and even denying it, you know, because he admitted, yeah, I do encounter it every now and then, but yeah, there is no racism, you know. And, and that, again, look at his position. He does not want to offend uh, his constituents, his constituency. He doesn't want to offend the other white, the, the majority white Republican party, um, because he knows that anything that he would try to accomplish, they would not back it. And so he says the party line, the accepted, because that's just one example of how that happens. Okay. Now you you also mentioned uh, you were you were, you were, we were talking the other day. You mentioned uh, well well why are well, because I, was, I think I asked you the question well why are white people uh, are racist and you said you you indicated something about power what they're afraid of. You want to share that? You want to open up with that? Yeah, sure. Um, Build the beans. You were <laughs> you were uh, you were a good. Um, channel for that but what i said is that for white people power is a poor substitute for love mm -hmm. um so i would say i think what makes it hard for white people to be honest most of the time uh, not all the time but most of the time is that we don't know ourselves as profoundly as um folks of color know themselves what do you mean by that? Um, so in order to survive, folks of color have had to learn to control their reactions. To control your reactions, you have to know what makes you tick. To know what makes you tick, you have to do a certain growing process of learning how to catch it earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier, right? Mm, okay. Um, mm -hmm because of privilege, because our systems are, um, you know, there aren't as many retaliations for your point, right, to white people for uh, when we burst out crying or when we burst out in anger, right? There aren't mm -hmm. as many. Mm -hmm. What that's meant, and, and, some, and we can skittle out of it more often than folks of color can because of privilege, then what happens is that um, we get to, I don't think it's an actual privilege, but I think we get to walk um, with a lot more arrogance and a lot less knowledge of ourself. Mm. And systems are designed for us to not discover who we are, really are. Like, mm -hmm. so, because as long as we are not true to ourselves, we will uphold the system. As long as white people are not true to themselves, you said they will uphold. We will uphold uh, the system. What would it take for them to get to that place, do you think? What, what, what in your estimation you think would take for them to get to that? Well, my, my big thing is that I think we have to learn, this is saying as white folks, we have mm -hmm. to learn how to build communities actually based on love. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've been talking with a few white folk and, and looking at my own experience as a child. And um, I had very loving parents, but I didn't mm -hmm. feel my parents' love until, I don't know, 35, 38. Oh, okay. Um, there's so much focus in white families on performance and being able to mm -hmm. have the have the high paying job and the best car and the bigger house, um, that oftentimes we don't actually feel the love of our families. 
we have to kind of achieve all of that mm. or overachieve all of that before we can actually trust our family's love. And some people never do. And I think that's okay. the wound. You often talk about the wounds of racism. So I think what the mm -hmm. wounds of racism do for white folk is they, um, they have us seeking power and control as a substitute for love because we don't okay. really right. have the groundedness of knowing that our family has our back no matter what. We don't walk in the world that way. So, so, so yeah. upholding the system is the only way that we gain value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was what you had said that, 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 that uh, piqued my interest when you said that upholding the system is where white people generally find their worth and value. And without that system, which black people and people of color, we're trying to break that system. Yeah. And of course, they're not being just so then you have a clash or a tug of war that's going on. Um, for white people to admit that, but I think you said something too, that if they lose that power, then they have nothing else to cling on to. And that's part of why they also to that power. Am I correct when uh, the way you yeah, said that? You made a, you made a, cool link with abuse, right? And you were saying mm -hmm. that for black folk to be honest with white people, it's sort of like the, the ex person who's been an, a, a survivor of abuse needing to confront the abuser, right? Yeah. And, and that takes a lot of healing. Like it takes a lot of healing to confront yeah. your abuser yeah. and say enough, right? Yeah, it, it um, takes a lot of courage. Most yeah. of us survivors just go on with our lives and decide we're, we're gonna do everything we can to never see the, the abuser again, right? And black folk don't mm -hmm. have that option, unfortunately. Right. Yeah, that's part of the problem with the, 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 the <laughs> yeah. abuse that occurred. So if if someone is abused and they're able to get away from the abuser, there is a space for them to be able to heal and to reinvent themselves, so to speak. Yeah. But given the situation, uh, the proximity of blacks and whites in the country there is never that relief, so to yeah. speak. Say, okay, let me take a deep breath and try to get. And so, if you compare that to, a, 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 and I use a woman, I use I use women as an example because we know we know of the situation, the, the power, uh, and going back to power there again, that to confront their abuser is is triggering for them. It's traumatic for them, and it takes a lot of courage. I look, I watch Law and Order. That's one of my favorite shows, and, uh, and particularly SVU, uh, Special Victims Unit. And oftentimes, when a woman is raped, they, they they show that fear that she has of seeing that person, confronting that person to be able to bring them to justice. And sometimes they 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 back out of it because the, the, the fear is so triggering for them. And so when we deal with, when we look at the race, uh, uh, the, the encounters between Blacks and whites, Blacks have adapted ways in which to maneuver uh, around and pretty much the same way an abused woman does, um, they will make excuses. They will say, well, if I do this, if I do that, then he won't do this to me. It happened because I did this. And we see that same kind of thing played out throughout the history of, of, of Blacks and whites in America, where Blacks, having come out, come out of a, several hundred years of abuse, now figuring that, well, if we do this, if we do these things, if we do these things, then we will be okay. We will be accepted. But then there is more backlash. There is more abuse that is heaped on top of, uh, of the abuse. So it continues. Um, yes. So I'd like to um, take the metaphor a little further. Okay. So the metaphor I would use is that of addiction. 
Mm, okay. Where um, many people in the realm of addiction will say that um, the the uh, opposite of addiction isn't being sober. The opposite of addiction is connection. Okay. But if and when we're able, and AA and all um, 12-step programs kind of based on that principle, like if you can create a sense of community around the user that's strong enough and bold enough and unconditional enough, then eventually that sense of connection will override their need mm -hmm. to use whatever, whatever the substance is again. So I think from having seen my own journey for the white folks who I've coached and a number of white folks who I've been in conversations with, which isn't the whole world but uh, of white folks, but is a sample, um, mm -hmm. What I see is that um, we are constantly, we, when we play by the systems book, we're doing it because we're trying to catch either approval, value, recognition, something that we felt that we and love, ultimately love, that we don't feel that we've actually had at home. Mm. And that so fine, what I think society. it would... Yeah, what I think it would take is for white people to be able to generate communities that have that level of unconditional love so we mm -hmm. could get connection from real love as opposed to trying to get power to get love or trying to get value or to get love or to trying to prove ourselves to get love. But ultimately, I would argue it's really all to get love. Yeah. You know, that, 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 that is extremely profound because when you said it to me the other day, I had never thought of it uh, from that angle. And I've been playing through my mind various uh, things that have occurred or events that happen. And so I think of, for example, um, let's say, the extreme white supremacist groups, the, the neo-Nazis and, and, and the KKK and so forth, that, that sense of, I guess, community, if I could say, is what they're seeking. Uh, they fear, I guess, in some respect, that to have others that are not white threatens their, their identity and their, um, well, they get love from that, you're saying. They get, they, they're trying to derive. They get connection from, from that. that. It's a bonding through hate. Some people call it toxic bonding, right? Like mm. traumatic bonding, like they're bonding through hate. Um, they would say that they're, they're protecting those who threaten their lifestyle, right? Okay. I would argue that it's still based on fear, where mm -hmm. actually the fear is if that they don't protect, they'll be chastised and sent away. Uh -huh. So it's a perform like that too is a performance. I'm going to protect my own because that's my job as a man. Uh -huh. But really, I think what's underneath that is if I don't protect my own, then my people will see me as invaluable. Mm -hmm. And if I'm invaluable, because whiteness is all about being superior, if you mm -hmm. can't prove that you're superior, then you can't be white, then you're almost not human. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh... Because in whiteness, there is, no, there is no honoring of humanity in whiteness. There's no honoring of the humanity of people of color, but there's also no honoring of our own. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that brings us to the issue of, okay, how do you possibly resolve that? And the, what, you, the, what you're saying is the, the remedy of love. Love is the, uh, the, the source or the, the antidote that you would say would be for the white community. Now on my side, what, what we would generally say, okay, we've been wronged and you wronged us. And pay for that. You need wait, wait one second. You've been wronged and the communication went out for a second. We've been wronged and what else? We've been wronged 
and you did the wrong and now you should pay for that wrong in the system in the general system of the world that is known as reparations you restore us or you repair us uh, um try to take bring bring us back to a, the place that we were before the injury before the wounds were inflicted and there is that great resistance and the the, the other part of that is when it comes to blacks we see the white world operating and giving reparations to others who and i don't minimize the injury that was done to them uh but whom we deem well that only happened to them for a few years we're talking about centuries and and you don't see the need to give us the reparations and of course then they get into the whole thing well how would you possibly pay this back i'm not concerned with that let's get let's just get to the table and say yes there's a wrong that has to be some re, uh repairing that has to be done here on the other side on the white side they see that as a threat because that's part of their power if i i, I would assume that's their power uh when we say we want reparations we want to take away some of your power because they're powered by those material things that they have right would you would you would you see it that way or, or how would you see it that i think we're first scared of the truth and then scared of losing the stuff but i actually think the being scared of the truth is the first Mm. Because again, white, and now I know that what I'm about to describe doesn't sound very painful to black folk because <laughs> you've survived some things, right? Like you've yeah. survived some profound, profound um, criminality and their injury, right? Mm -hmm. I would say is white criminal behavior. Um, but for white folk, the challenge is that like anything any any reconciliation has to come with truth first right mm -hmm. like you, are, you need this wake-up call right you need this wake-up call of like oh all that america the best thing was not true mm -hmm. yeah we're not the best country in the world mm -hmm. now i would argue that folks of color when they hear that in school they know it's not true mm -hmm. white folks believe it yeah, you, you, you. And so when yeah. you start talking about the injustices of our history, it's an mm -hmm. earthquake of personal identity. Because yeah. if I'm not the best in the world, then who am I? Because I believed right. it. Okay. All right. You know, you know, I, I, I totally concur with you on that. I had to teach um, several American history classes uh, for a while. And I got in that class a, a bevy of white students. I have white students in the African American studies classes, of course. But in the American history course, what I did, I did not take the uh, traditional approach of just talking about what great uh, these great white men did, the slave owners and so forth. I talked about the native people of the land, first of all, and then just as it was done to them. I talk about women the injustice that were done to women, and then African American people, as well as other uh, people of color. So I incorporate, I try to incorporate that whole piece. And I got pushback from many of the students saying, why are we talking about black people? And why are we talking about Indians? We're supposed to be talking about American history. And I'm like, this is American history. So what you just said helps to, um, to 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 understand what what I was doing. Like you said, I was creating an earthquake for them. It's like, well, if we don't have this, and and and, and with it, within that, while I'm teaching that, hey, America is not the greatest country. You, I, you 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 believe that if you only stay inside of America, if you go outside of America, or even if you sit and watch your television. Uh, programs discovery and you you'll see that wow 
you know. Uh, yeah, we pretty much have some things going for us, and we have a bunch of contradictions, just like every other country. Right, exactly. Right, like. But but we want to believe that. Oh no, we don't have those kind of contradictions. We no, are we don't just have those contradictions. Yeah. Above so, uh, reproach. Yeah. So to your point about reparations, because I don't I don't want my talking about truth to deflect from reparations. I think. Mm -hmm. I think for us white folk to get how essential and important reparations are, we have to fully get the impact of what we've done. The truth, yeah. And to fully get the impact of what we've done, I think we have to get it not only on the impact it's had on, uh, on African Americans or Native Americans or any other uh, folk of color for that reason, we mm -hmm. have to come to terms with the diminished humanity Mm. of us as oppressors right because for right. me to diminish your humanity i have to have already diminished my own mm -hmm. and violence diminish diminishes my humanity further right yeah. mm -hmm. so if i if we really come to terms with what the impact is then we'll want to do reparations because like if i hurt you deeply and I'm in fully in empathy with you. I want to do something to make it better. Right. I don't want to right. do something to make it better when I'm in denial about the harm I've caused you. Yeah. We're very, still in very denial. True. Very true. Um, and and I, 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 I compare this to what happens in, in many of my classes with white students in my classes and what they have said to me. Um, and I, I said this for all the students, blacks and whites. For, for black students, a lot of the information that we get, they'll get to a point where they're like, I hate white people. And I'm like, okay, that's good. You should feel that because part of the, the denial of our humanness during enslavement and after, we weren't able to fully express ourselves as human, we as humans. That is a natural reaction. You must feel that, but you can't stay there. You have to feel that and then move forward. The same thing with, uh, I would have white students that would say to me like, man, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really ashamed of my race. I, I'm, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm almost, they'll almost say, I hate white people. I hate being white, you know, or something like that. And I said, well, it's not so much about being white. It's the same thing for you. You have to feel your humanity, what happened to your humanity or your humanity of your people and come to reconcil uh, a reconciliation with that. And I go back to enslavement in 1865 when, uh, you know, when it's 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation was, was done and slavery was over, everybody pretended like, well, uh, everything is okay now. We can all just be whatever we want. But you came out of 400 odd years of someone abusing and someone being abused and nobody got any therapy. Nobody, and that's part of reparations. Therapy, the healing is part of what reparations is about. White people didn't get any therapy for the abuse that they had done. It was just like, well, okay, everything is over, blah, blah, blah. Black people didn't get any therapy, nor any kind of uh, reparations. Everything was, you know, supposed to get the 40 acres and the mule and so forth. That was reneged, reneged on, upon. And so then you move forward as if everything is okay. So you have an abuser and an an abuser and the abused, but, but all of them are abused in some kind of way, pretending like, well, we're not abused. And that's why you have like a George Floyd, because you have to ask, well, what caused? And I would often say, I remember, I don't know if you remember this case. It was in New York, uh, Amadou Jallo, I believe was his name, is uh, Senator Lease. And they shot him at four. 40 times, and I'm like, hey, don't shoot an elephant 40 times. 
You don't shoot a charging lion 40 times. And it's been case after case like that where there's this overkill of black men in particular, but black women as well. And you ask, what is going on in their mind at that point? And so to your point of what you said, that fear, I guess it's deeply embedded that somehow or another by doing this, I am obliterating that, that, that threat. Uh, I, that, that's what I'm assuming is going on. And so then when it comes to particular with the police, when they say, well, they need more training, they need more training. I'm like, they don't need any more training. They were talking about that in the 1980s. I remember in the 1990s, I'm like, they need to be held accountable. There is no accountability. And so if there's no accountability, people do, you know, they, they do what they want because they know that there is very little retribution that they're going to receive. How that plays into the, the minds of whites, I'm trying to process what you said because that's a new angle for me in terms of that power and identity. But, you know, um, but I talk about cultural identity crisis with black people, but I guess there's also some kind of cultural identity with white people as well. Um, I don't really address that. I, I, I would need two or three lifetimes to deal with it. That's why- You don't I, have man, to, you don't have to. That's, like, you stay in your lane. <laughs> I don't have people like you that, that deals with, because uh, most white people will hear you, well, majority of white people, they will hear you on the topic more readily. They may not just embrace you right away, but they, they can hear you because you are them. As opposed to myself, they tend to not want to hear unless they're put in a situation and they're open and and I've seen it I've seen it happen over and over and over with the students that I've dealt with over the years uh white students that I've I've, I've dealt with uh it's possible it's possible well, my, my kudos to you because it national takes national therapy session <laughs> it takes uh it takes a lot of courage to kind of <clears throat> hold space for students in diverse classes because yeah. um, I've heard a lot of um, black professors like you be really, really frustrated at how white students question their knowledge and authority like over and over and over again. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I hear when you talk about your students, I see the same twinkle in your eye and the same passion and determination that I know in a lot of my own professors. And so I honor that in you. Hmm. Well, I appreciate it. I um the <clears throat> many ironically many of the white students that I've had most of them were open. I didn't get a lot of pushback when I first started teaching. However, I did. Um, as time has gone on, because I guess I've honed my stuff. I don't leave any room for a wiggle. They're like you got to go. You got to deal with this. If you're in yeah. class, this is what you're going to have to deal with, and uh, so I have them isolated for a, a period of time where, and I have the reading material. I'll give an example of something that happened to me when I first started teaching. I and was, Kamal, I want to shift gear, right after your yeah. example. I want to shift uh, gears for a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was teaching course and, uh, there was a young white man in the class and he would, I would say something and he would raise his hand He said, well, uh, where can I get more information about that? But uh, you know, and I would give him give him the sources. Uh, uh, do who else has said something about that? He would constantly question what I was saying, right? And so at the end of the semester, he came to me and said he wanted to have an appointment uh, with me. And I said, okay. And we sat down. And he said, I want to apologize to you because I know I was very antagonistic in the class because I didn't want to believe the things that you were saying. And that goes back to that history. I was revealing that ugly, those ugly wounds. And he said, what I did, I was going back to the white professors in the department and I was playing the devil's advocate 
with them to saying what you were saying, hoping that they would be able to give me some information that I could come back and refute you. And he said, they couldn't in case after case that they, they couldn't give me any information. And so he said, I had to really look at the information and I want to apologize to you for, for doing that. Your class, you know, he, that was one case uh, of that, the most severe case I think I've had um, of white students. Most of them are very respectful, uh, except in that American history class. And I can tell you a story in there. Ooh. These people, they wanted an A plus <laughs> and they had the nerd to come back saying they did, they should have gotten an A in the class. And I, but I was ready. I was like, no, no, you're not getting an A. <laughs> I ignored them. Uh, when that. But you said you want to change the. Uh, I, I do. I want to shift gears a little, little bit and I want to uh, throw a challenge out to you and myself. OK, right? like I feel like up until now, we've kind of talked about it. Right. Instead of like, and I'd love for us to shift gears and drop into what does it look like? Right. Mm. Um, so I'm wondering if we can um, like kind of drop, drop into our hearts and our bellies and like, what is it that we really want to say to each other? You and me, I know we're doing this publicly, which is an interesting challenge, but like yeah. you and me, I, you to me and I to you. Right, mm -hmm. like what is the level of honesty that we can share right now that we wouldn't usually share, <laughs> right? Okay, well, uh, from, from my part, you know, when I'm asked of, uh, what racism is, and I do a whole big piece on this, and uh, and this is what my book is about as well. Uh, the white people show how to understand racism and still be wrong about it. Racism is the, uh, because what I do in the classes, I'll ask students, and I, I, I came to a, through a process to this, to get to this point with the students over a few years. I would ask them, okay, what is racism? And I know that nobody is gonna answer the question. No one in the class is usually gonna answer the question right. I've had, I can count on less than 10 students out of 25 years that actually got the, the definition right when I asked them. And I would write on the board what they were saying. And, and then I would go and I was like, well, these are symptoms of racism. This is not racism itself. And so I asked the students, so let's say, pretend that racism walks into the classroom. How would you know that it's racism? And they ponder and ponder. And then I kind of take them out of their misery. And I, just, I say that racism is the belief of doctrine, doctrine that one or one's group is superior to others. That's basically the diction, a dictionary definition. But that definition doesn't really identify, well, who are you talking about? And so I modify that definition to say, racism is the belief held by white-skinned people, those who classify themselves as white-skinned, that they are superior or better than those who are not white-skinned do not possess white skin. And on top of that, they are the only group in the history of the world that has ever done that. No one else has done that that we know of document, documentarily that has ever done that. Black people have never claimed that we are superior yeah. to anyone else simply because of the skin color. We say we're superior because, you know, the Egyptians, for example, hey, they say hey, we're superior because of our culture. Yeah. The Japanese so, say that they're superior because of their religion, Shintoism. And so, so can I offer, you said something really awesome before about uh, how how healing didn't happen for for anyone on the side of the, on the mm -hmm. other side of the civil war, right? So, yeah. um, so the way that feels for me is that I'm appalled by the idea that any of me would want to be superior. Right, because my whole mm -hmm. life has been about walking the walk. Yeah. And um, the honest thing that I could say is that the superiority is a voice that's been so strengthened in my head mm -hmm. over er every year of my life, right? That being superior means being valuable. So yeah. that when I want to show up honestly in conversation with you, it's like there's this thing in my head. Okay. That's running that's running on its own. And it makes yeah. it really hard 
uh, to show up from the heart. And it makes it really hard to, uh, because I think honesty takes always a level of risk. Yeah, for sure. Right? And mm -hmm. so for me to be really honest with you right now, I have mm -hmm. to be willing to say something I've never said before and say something I haven't heard myself say before. Yeah. And the part of me that's trying to be superior is terrified of that. Yeah. What, you want to try something new when you're alive and you can't go and, yeah, you can erase it technically, but, yeah. you know. Um, and it can be an obsession and it can take away the very thing that I yearn for most, which is connection. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, I think that, and I'm trying to remember, a psychologist said this, um, Naeem Akbar, uh, has said that generally when we, I, I don't remember how he said it, I'm thinking of this on the top of my head relative to what you just said. When we act, when we, when we stand up for ourselves as Black people, white people see that as a threat they see that as knocking them down so to speak that wasn't the terminology he used but in essence that's what it was when we say we love ourselves then that then white people say well you don't love us no it had nothing to do with you uh black lives matter for example it's amazing how that just got totally misconstrued because what it was actually saying is black lives matter too. Not that other lives didn't matter, blue lives, and all lives and so No, we're saying black lives matter too. And they refused to look at the context of why would you say that? How did that come about when you, that's, that's painful because it reveals that that the injury, people, they're speaking out of injury. I think it's Dr. Martin Luther King said, riot is the voice of the, is the, is the, the voice of the voiceless. That's, that's how they act. They, they riot, they tear up because you're not hearing me. And kind of tying this into what you said, what I know is part of the turning point for many of the white students in my classes is when I deal with slavery or enslavement and the brutality, the horror of, and I have films that we watch in addition to what they're reading and they see that and, they, and, and because they, they've they never been exposed to that before. It was just like, well, there was slavery in this country, but we moved past it. But the horror of it, the, the I mean, that's the thing I think that gets them and they are able to see because many of them would, would be like, I would never do that. I would not do that. And they start to ask, but how could, how could these people do this? How could my people do this? You know, they begin, to, and I've had conversations, I've had deep conversations with uh, some of the, uh, the students and what they're tussling with, but none of them ever articulated the way you said, I guess they didn't have the words uh, and the insights in, that you bring to the table about the power and identity. Does that, does that answer some of your question or what your curiosity? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I'm clear about the kind of healing work white folks have to do right and that i have to do because i'm still on that journey right like i'm not done we're never done yeah you know like uh, uh jane elliott who, who I, I i mean i have this major respect for her and, and what she says and what she's done over the years and i remember she was on oprah winfrey's show this is years ago now and she talked about, I've been fighting against racism all my life. She said, my family was racist. And she said, every day I have to fight it. Every, every day I've been aware, if I don't, it'll slip back in. And I thought, that, wow, that, that, that is profound. Uh, 
And so when you say your journey, that's, it's a never ending journey because the injury is so deep and so long on all the way around that it's not something that, uh, you know, you put a bandaid on and uh, put some alcohol on or some antiseptic on it and go about your business. It's... So I'm curious, would you share, since our, com our, our top theme today, right, is about how do we meet? <laughs> Right, like how do we meet at honest conversations? Um, I'm curious, um, what piece of this is something that, like, what does that look like in your world? What is the piece that you work on continuously? For myself, you saying? Yeah. Uh, wow. I deal with it more. Uh, I deal more with the impact that it's had on my people in terms of their behavior. I understand why they're doing some of the things that they're doing. Uh, and my uh, goal is to help them to understand something about that. Why are you calling each other the N word? It's not because you, know, you gain ownership of the word. That, that, that's, that's, the response of somebody that has been abused and they don't know what they, they have taken on the characteristic of the abuser. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so I'm trying, I'm working to deal with healing the wounds, as we pointed out, healing the wounds uh, of racism that my people have encountered. And that's a difficult task because they're constantly, uh, you, you clean up somebody today and you send them out and then they get some more wounds, they gotta come back. But they have to recognize that that's what's going to happen until they can get strong enough within themselves. In my own journey, uh, my mentors, I actually started taking a class with them. The class was supposed to be, uh, I think it was supposed to be like, 26 weeks or something like that. It ended up being three years, <laughs> three years uh, of working with them because uh, there was a group of us that was grasping what they said and we wanted the answers. We were trying to see and, and, and process this whole thing of what happened to us. And they were able to do that and bring us to a place of, of healing where my identity, was restored. Uh, for example, why well, my name? My name is Kamal Tabidiwa Kenyatta. I took an African name as a, as, a, as a indication of self identification because I understood what happened during slavery. I didn't lose my name. My ancestors didn't lose their name. Their names were taken. And part of my humanity is to identify myself, not be identified by someone else. And um, I had a European name and it got to a point where I could not stand if someone called me that. And I was like, how could I have a, a black man? How, why do I have this European name? Uh, no Europeans have African names, you know? And that's part of the superiority piece. You know, um, so the journey is a long one. I, it, what happened to me didn't happen uh, from one session like this or a couple of classes or a semester in college, three years and then continuous uh, treatment with them for almost 10 years afterward um, to get to a place where my humanity, I'm strong enough to stand in my own place, my own humanity. And so what I try to do is help uh, my people to get to that place, you know. Um, the role I see is yours. This is what you're gonna have to do with your people. <laughs> you, because they, they, they will hear me on some level, but they'll hear you on a deeper level because they have to fight where the, the, what they're seeing, you know, that you 
how could you say this? And once you put the question there, there's a saying that the universe, in the universe, there are no unanswered questions. If you put a question out there and you ask, why do you hate black people, for example? Why do you feel that you are better than white people? I mean, than black people. Um, and they have to really go through that. But if they're in an environment that reinforces that, then it's more difficult. They have to first be open. None is as blind as he who refuses to see. And they say, does that answer some of? Yes, absolutely. OK. So absolutely. Um, you kind of answered the, the kind of last question I had for you, which was, um, what do you need from white folk in the work like white folk like me um and you spoke to that a little bit i'm wondering yeah. if there's anything more yeah well i need you to to do what you're doing speaking to your people uh when i talked with uh, when i met tim wise um i talked to him about this and i, I don't know if you're familiar with him or not but he's got a poignant story of how he came to this yeah. place that he grew up in the South, privileged, and he had black friends and he got accepted at school and they didn't. And he was like, this guy's smarter than I am, huh? And he, and all these, these little incidents happened in his life and he had to reassess stuff. He, um, you know, uh, understanding like what I'm saying and then being able to take that to, to white people and show them. For, uh, for example, uh, one of the things that you might be able to do is the slavery experience, the enslavement experience. And I have material that I can share with you that could help them because most people do not know, black and white, do not really know what happened during slavery the enslavement of black people. It, it, it was a hell, a horrific hell. And I often ask students, I'm like, let's suppose you have a Chinese person. How do you make that Chinese person un-Chinese? Where they get to the point where I'm not Chinese. Uh, I don't identify with Chinese, uh, Chinese culture or nothing. What do you have to do to a person to get them, do you realize the deep psychological interruption and damage that you have to do to that person to get them to that point? That's part of what happened to African people, black people, where they get to the point where I'm not African. It's like, what do you mean you're not African? Uh, I'm American. You know, uh, well, what is American? You know. Um, you have to ask those questions sometimes. And going back to what you were saying, the ultimate, the ultimate piece is love. And this is this is what our mentors taught us too. And I remember when they used to say it, I was like, come on, this love thing, man. I'm like, oh, love. It took me a long time to understand what they were saying. Because that's 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 the ultimate reality of the world and what you you mentioned about that white people don't feel loved and this is why but the, the only thing that that re, they replace that with power what they what they think it was, the attempt uh, to place it with power power doesn't have the same strength and satisfaction of love no right? the attempt no. to no, no, not, not at all. And now when I'm talking about love, I'm not talking about a mamby-pamby kind of uh, let's hold hands and sing kumbaya type of thing. And, and I know most people, and I, and I did too, I had a misunderstanding of the concept of love. I know Dr. Martin Luther King used to talk about it, and I had a problem with him. Going, hey, he's talking about this love thing, you know. But that is the strongest power in the world. Hate can never overcome love. It, 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 it can never. It doesn't have that, that power. Now, to get to that, 
It takes some fortitude. <laughs> it takes some fortitude and some maturity. I think maturity. You know, <clears throat> the interesting thing is about when you look at little children, black and white little children, they play together, have no problem. When you look at older black and white people, they generally get along pretty good. Those two continuums is the in between <laughs> that that is interesting, but particularly with the children. And I relate the story in my uh, book uh, about my grandmother. Um, when uh, I used to go to the doctor's office with her in my small town, and uh, it was segregated. Uh, there was a door for for whites only and for colors only. And we would go inside and there was a receptionist that was sitting in the middle, um, accepting everybody that came in. Uh, black people sat on this side, white people sat on this side, but you could see each other, you know. And oftentimes my grandmother would be having conversation with some of the white women on the other side. They would be having conversation. And I asked my grandma, I'm like, how you know her? And she said, uh, oh, we used to play together when we were kids. I'm like, y'all used to play together? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, why y'all don't play together? Why? So what happened? And she said, oh, well, when they got to a certain age, her parents told her she couldn't play with no ends. <laughs> and um, they need to know their place and you need to know your place. And so they stopped playing together. And she had to start calling her playmate, former playmate, Mrs. So-and-so, or Miss So-and-so. And that 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 whole, you know, so children, if you watch children, they don't know that. They, they learn it. And then I point out it's not as poignant with older people, but generally older people, everybody gets more gentle. Most people get more gentle. Uh, in their older age, because they are now dependent on other people. And so they can see the humanity in other people, you know, I think, I think it's particularly true for whites that get older. You know. Yeah, because I think they don't have anything to prove anymore. So the superiority piece gets a little bit right, right, right to the source of what you, you were talking about, the power. The obsession is probably a little lessened with age for some, not for everyone. Not for everyone, no, no, because there were some that the older that that they are just racist to the grave. I, like I said, I grew up in South Carolina. I remember Jesse Helms and uh, what was the other guy's name? They were about racist, man. They were senators, Senator Hollins uh, from South Carolina, and there was another one, man. They were just blatant. Until they, to the day they died, man, it was like, you know. Yep, some are. Yeah. So uh, we've been going at it for an hour and 10 minutes, believe it or not. Yeah, so we did I'm do curious. the hour. We should, got... we, should we do like uh, closing thoughts? Well, yeah, and, and, and I would say women first. Ah! <laughs> Put me women on the first. spot. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm just honored to be in the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, like there, there are moments of this conversation that as always were new for me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've been studying racism and um, black authors and the black struggle for for almost 30 years now and there's just no getting away from the fact that i'm white and that there are aspects of the experience that i i'm not i don't get and so i'm just really thankful anytime um i can sit down and have a conversation and learn more and i did in this conversation thank you yeah uh likewise i would say the same thing there were things uh, from the conversation we had the other day and the reinforcement of that tonight uh, that you said that gave me some insight that I had not seen. I had an inkling of some of it, but I had not artic articulated it the way in which you uh, did. Uh, for me, in 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 an honest conversation about has 
this is their uh, definition of what racism is and let it settle in. Because we run from uh, what, 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 what happens in the society, we run from that definition. We try to soften it. Oh, it's bias. It's this, that. No, it's racism. It's discrimination. It's prejudice. No, it's racism. It's the white people believing that they are superior simply because of their skin color and not because of any merit. To start there, that, that, that opens up a wound that begins the healing process. If you don't start there, I, I, my, from my vantage point, it's not going to be very productive. Okay, so I appreciate you. I appreciate your the, the, the courage. I think on both our parts uh, to do this because I had not an, anticipated uh, doing anything of uh, this nature. But I always kind of knew that something of this nature has to take place. It has to take place more and more. We're not going to, we don't see it in the media, because, particularly the, the, the corporate sponsored media, because the conversations get cut short, they get redirected, anger comes up, or they bring in other elements in it. They don't stay on one point for. A time let's let the fire get hot right here because usually when the fire gets hot we go we got to go over here so we got to go here and keep moving i think we have settled in that one spot and i'm i'm open to having further uh conversations uh with it i've been in, involved in these conversations ironically with uh many whites particularly my uh, white students uh, over the years um many of whom I'm, I'm still uh, friends with, and they are, they, they got it. They, they, they got it. They're still being themselves, but there's an element of them. I see them on Facebook and other places all the time saying stuff, and I'm like, wow. You know, or they'll get in touch with me and say, you know, so and so. And I appreciate that. So there is hope at some point. But I think racism is permanent for the foreseeable future. It's permanent. Uh, because, and now at this stage in history, it's like, whoa. You really dropped that, that ball, like, right at the end. Right, right at the end, you dropped that. The racism is permanent. Yeah, well, that's yeah, part you got to drop that, really? <laughs> that's, that's part of what my book That's is. a conversation for another time. <laughs> yeah, we can have that conversation. We can, we can have, have that, that conversation, conversation another time. You know, that, that's the the impetus of my book, and I and I I I didn't come to that conclusion easy, mm. you know. But I, it's not yeah. a pessimistic view. It's not a view where a nihilistic view, you know. Uh, it's certainly a realistic one. It's realistic for the foreseeable future until we do some work. I agree. I can you know, definitely the agree. The kind of work that we started right here. Yeah. yeah it was an great. honor, Professor Kamal. Yes, Dr. Uh, Fierro. It was yeah. my pleasure, my honor, and um, I, I suspect we'll be doing some things like this, and we'll be meeting back in the class that we're a part of. <laughs> you know, the, you were on the hot seat last night, but you did an excellent job. Oh, thank you. you thank you. I appreciate job. it. I was in the hot seat. I wasn't up on the stage. I'm like, I hope they don't put me up here tonight. I'm like, I'm not ready for this, you know. <laughs> yeah. It was yeah. really an honor. Let's uh should we close out for now or you have other final thoughts? No, I'm I'm pretty much I think we've given uh, everybody enough. We've recorded this so for because I, I was getting messages, uh some people couldn't get in for whatever reasons and so forth. And uh I'm uh, I want to make it available. I'll put it on my website. I'm sure you put it on your website or I'll make it up on YouTube or wherever uh, we can make this uh, available. Because um, there were a lot of people interested. I mean, a lot of people were interested. When I started putting it up, they were like, man, I want to get in. I want to hear this conversation. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we don't have like a podcast where people could, we could have the interaction. 
because I think we needed to just talk as opposed to just yeah. having other people come into it at this point. Well, we can we can arrange that for the next time. <laughs>